What's going on, everybody? My name is Tech. Welcome to the Reseller Greatness Podcast. Today, I am very, very lucky to be joined by Carrie, who goes by Carrie at home on YouTube. And she's been reselling for a couple of years, just started out a couple of years ago. And you had like a pretty, you know, astronomical growth straight out of the gate. Um, I think that you took a lot of the stuff that we talk about, you implemented it, you absolutely did. And um, I know you have a video on your channel where you did $240,000 last year, which is very, very awesome, very, very excellent. So I am very much looking forward to having this conversation with you because although you've been in the group for a while, like we do cross paths here and there, but like we don't really have many in-depth discussions. So this will be like our very first in-depth discussion where you've asked questions, we've talked, but we haven't talked for an hour before. So me personally, I am excited <laughs> to learn much more about everything that you do and the success that you've had. So if you want to give a quick introduction, go for it. Yeah. So I started reselling. This is my, I'm going into my third year. So I've completed two years of reselling now. And I come from a background where I did not like reselling because my husband, Kyle did it. And it was such a gamble. I thought reselling was like, you're gambling your money away. You're buying bad stuff. Sometimes you buy good stuff. Like I hated all the nuances and it just seemed like it was the wild, wild west. So I absolutely despise reselling for the most part. It had its perks. It helped pay for our very low budget wedding, which was great. <laughs> but uh, other than that, I didn't want anything to do with reselling until one day uh, Kyle introduced me to the daily refinement and that's whenever you were doing the podcast with him uh, and everything that I heard in that podcast, it was like pure truth. I was like, all of this makes sense. I don't doubt any of this because I like to listen to a lot of information and like kind of mm -hmm. filter it out. And if it yeah. doesn't make sense, I get rid of it. This was like I'm on board. Like this all makes sense. I can see how to do this correctly. And so I came into that group. I watched probably about five videos in one week, joined that group, and then just started like deep diving into all that information that you guys had. And I was basically fresh, you know, new brain. I didn't have any of these preconceived ideas of how to sell on eBay and all these conspiracies and all that. Like I was just straight fresh, absorbed everything that you guys had available. Um, I found my niche really quickly. I like to niche down even before reselling. I just wanted to focus on one thing. So I started focusing on clothes and I niched down even further into just jeans because I liked the durability, the vintage jeans. Like I just had a more gravitational pull to that. So I just dove straight into jeans <laughs> at that point. And I would say the astronomical growth that I that I had is 110% all because of the group and all because of everything that I learned from you guys. So if I came into it with my own background, my own whatever, I don't think honestly I would have as much of a success that I've had now because I would have to untrain everything and then regrow. So I just grew from step one. So that was my background of how I got started. I didn't know your husband got you into it. I thought you got your husband into it, which you kind of did once you got it up and running because I know mm -hmm. you guys also have a business too. So you also have a couple of kids, two or three kids. We have two kids, two one seven-year-old, one five-year-old. Excellent. So, all right. You looked at reselling as a complete gamble. And from, from what I know with you is you do take in all of that information. You do process it because you'll ask a bunch of questions sometimes. And then you'll never say like, okay, that's what I do. You'll say, okay, let me think about this. <laughs> yeah. You always say, okay, okay, let, let me think about this. And you process it. So, all right, what happened in that time frame when, when you heard the first video and when you had one week's of kind of information to change it? What was the light bulb moment where like, this is not a gamble and like, this could be for real? What changed for you? How did that change? When I found out that there's a thing called sold comps. Okay. <laughs> that's, the, that's the light bulb where I was like, you can actually see how many is listed and how many sold. 
right. for the prize. Right. That that's the light bulb moment. Like I guess sell through rate with the sold comps. And right. it's always been sell through rate with me. I'm like, if if nobody wants this, I don't want it. I don't want to sell right. it. I want to buy something that people are highly seeking out. No, and it's not so much the price, it's just as long as people want this, I'll sell it. And obviously cool. the price goes into it. I've been working on my profit margin now for this year. But that was the light bulb moment whenever instead of me looking at sold comps being like, oh, two of these sold in like the past two weeks, it looks like, which was just arbitrary numbers. I wasn't looking at there was like 5,000 listed and only the two sold. So now I can be like, oh, okay, obviously let's not buy that because there's 5,000 of these and only two people wanted it. Sure. So, so that okay. was a light bulb. <laughs> so from the outside looking in, your husband brings home a bunch of stuff and he shows you a little bit of things on the phone and you're like, this is a gamble. Absolutely. I, I see one sale. Who knows anything? And then you went in and you started looking at the comps. You started looking at the market. And for an item, let's say there's 2,000 available, 2,000 sold, that connected. Mm -hmm. Or 2,000 available, 50 sold. No, thank you. 2,000 yeah. available, 3,000 sold. This is something that we need to go get. And I know um, straight from the jump, you were very, very focused on the sell through, but not only that, you were very, very focused on the nuance, which I guess in turn increased your sell through and increased the opportunity for the item to sell. So like when, when you say that you are a gene seller in a very short amount of time, like you were able to get a ton of knowledge and a great expertise in genes because we would talk, we do have the genes call with Andy. He has a lot of great information, but you have gone into the solds obviously because there's stuff where like, you know, someone will talk about it and you will say exactly what it is and whether it's good or exactly what it is and that it's not as good for you personally. Mm -hmm. So during this beginning time, when you started assessing the sell through and started learning about the genes, how was that entire process and kind of how did you figure out because you said you you said you wanted to niche not only into clothing into jeans but inside of jeans you had your own niche so like mm -hmm. how did you arrive at these items are acceptable for me and my business these items are the ones i want to study and these are the items that i'm going to go out and go find yeah it's just being out in the field I, I went to the bins a lot. And so I literally dug around for many, many, like hundreds of hours, pulling all the jeans that I thought were good, just based off of style and, you know, just my perceived notion of what I think somebody else would want. And then I just did my research on every single pair of jeans and it took forever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, honestly, I was so right. slow, but I wanted to be so diligent, making sure like, okay, this brand has some good stuff in it right. it's not just the brand it's a certain style that's good and a certain color that's good and a certain size so i was just trying to figure out pinpoint you know the general okay this size this color this brand but this style and so now whenever i'm sourcing i can just look at something and be like okay that'll sell that'll sell that won't sell even though the brand's good, I know it won't sell just from my past knowledge. So literally it was digging around. There's tons, tons of jeans out there that are not good. I, they're just complete garbage. Absolutely. E even if they're sold in the mall, once they come out of the mall, the tags off, they're garbage. So I have just definitely spent hundreds of hours researching as many brands in my area, because I know there's different brands in the United States and everything. So everything that I had to work with, I researched the, so much out of it. Um, but anyway, that's that's what I did. And now I have all that knowledge behind me. So now I can source. I'm still a little slow at sourcing because I want to make sure that the price is right now because sure. I'm being really particular with the price. But um, but yeah, that's that's basically how I started actually diving deep into my knowledge is just getting in there and looking it up. So you started at the bins. Do you still go to the bins? Do you go to the racks? Do you go to flea markets? How, how are you getting these excellent jeans that, you know, you did $240,000 worth last year? What yeah. is kind of like your tactic of getting them? So we went to the bins a lot. Um, 
last year. And that's where we got most of our stuff, just digging through the leftovers. But towards the end of last year, we realized that our profit margin wasn't what we wanted. So we started actually going up to the retail stores because the bins, you're literally digging through leftovers. The leftovers, yeah. Yeah. So we're going through the racks in the retail stores and we find way better stuff there, way better quality of items, way better brands, the higher price stuff. Sure, they cost more than the bins, but they're going to sell faster. There's more there. Honestly, I, most of our stuff comes from the racks now and the bins we still shop just to keep our average buy cost lower because you can still find really great stuff at the bins. Like I've pulled a vintage 1960 501s brand new dead stock from the bins and I paid two dollars for it it's insane sure and that's type that's the type of stuff where I don't think necessarily will make it to the racks because I feel like the goodwill employees are pulling what they know of like current day modern knowledge if they saw an old crusty dusty pair of Levi's they're just gonna toss it and have it yeah. go to the bins and that's where yeah. I find it they do the same thing here. So like our Goodwills are almost set up like a shopping mall. Like if anything is vintage, if, if something has a flaw, like there could be a 1986 Metallica shirt. And if it has a, a small little spot, that goes to the bin. So like mm -hmm. everything in our Goodwills is almost set up like a shopping mall. So, okay, I, I want to tackle a couple things there. Mm -hmm. You say you still go to the bins um, and you're doing that with the wreck. So at the bins... Are you more picky or do you have a wider range because the price is lower? So we are a little bit more lenient with the condition of jeans when they come from the bins. Um, say it's a pair of jeans that I can list for easily $50 plus shipping. And I'm going to get it for $2 at the bins. But the back pocket has like a small hole at the corner. Then I know I can spend $5 take it literally across the street to a seamstress, she'll patch it up and I can list it. So I'm a little bit more lenient. Now, if I have to spend 10 to $15 for that pair at the racks, it just depends on the pair at that point, because sometimes I'll sell things that have flaws if they're worth the money. But if there's too many weird flaws with it, it's too janky. I just don't pick it up even at the bins or definitely not on the racks if I'm paying up for it. My wife is the only person I've ever met that used the word janky and you just used the word janky. No. <laughs> I've never heard it outside of her. I just wanted to bring that up. I don't know quick. where that she comes from. She listens to the podcast and she'll get a kick out of that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So from people that go from the bins to the racks, there is a mental sticker shock mm -hmm. where we get stuck into, oh, $1 per piece, $2 per piece, 50 cents per piece. And then we see items on the rack for, like you said, eight, 10, even $15. Mm -hmm. How did you get over that? Did you look at the comps? Did, did you approach it from an analytical standpoint? Cause you do look at the market for me. I do not want bad items, even if they're free, mm -hmm. I will pay a good price for a good item. So like you said, I'll pay $15 for a good item. Mm -hmm. I, you you could pay me to take bad items and I do not want them. Yeah, definitely. I don't put bad items on my store. There might be an occasional slip up where this, the measuring is off, where they're just it's just too weird. But other than that, if the brand is not there, I do not pick it up, even if it's for free. Um, basically, it's just raise the standards of what you want to list. Um, it is a big sticker shock going from the bins to the stores. A hundred percent. I went through that. I got, I got freaked out because I'm like, oh my gosh, my cost of goods is going to go up. My profit margin is going to go down because it's always fluctuating with what you do. But this year I have honestly fully accepted the power of averages. So just the other day I spent Full price, like the most I spend on jeans of $22 on five pairs of brand new jeans that I knew would one sell really well. The sell through was super great because I don't want to gamble $125 on something that's garbage or that will sit. But over the course of that whole day, I was thinking, 
oh man, I bought $125 worth of jeans, only five jeans. My, my buy cost is going to be outrageous. My profit's going to be down and everything. And I spent maybe 50 cents more than average at the end of the day. Sure. I'm like, and I'm going to make a killing off of those jeans sure. for so 50 cents more. The The only thing with the average cost of goods, it's great globally, but like, I don't want people to hear that and say, because here's the thing, you can spend $22 on jeans and if you sell them for 15, you lost seven bucks. Mm -hmm. you, you don't get credit for your average cost being five, yeah. even though you spent 22. So we just have to make that clear. So if you have an average cost of goods and you know, you're able to sell those jeans that you bought for 22 for 50 or 60 or 80 or 100, mm -hmm. then that's fine. But if you buy something for 22 and in your head, my average cost of goods is five and I could sell these yeah. for 15, that don't work. You lost no. money on that deal. Just just to put it out there for everybody else. That's so, true, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So you said that if something has wear, you'll take it to the seamstress and you'll have them repair it. What kind of, I guess, what kind of flaws do you stay away from? What kind of flaws do you spend the money to repair? What is the gauge for that? Because I don't, I don't hear a lot of people talk about doing that. Mm -hmm. Honestly, if we didn't have a seamstress across the street, I don't, I don't think we would be doing it. But because we found out that we were just so lucky that we moved across the street from one, it did give us an opportunity to nice. still sell jeans that nice. just need a little bit of a patch. Um, not saying that we can't sell these jeans without them being repaired, but obviously the desirability will go up if they're patched or something. But I try to stay away from anything that is considered a project just because even though I have all the time in the world to do projects, whatever, um, <laughs> I, I don't want to deal with it. Like I'd rather go sit on the couch than deal yeah. with a project. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we had that opportunity and it just to make a few more dollars on stuff. So we just took it. So, all right. So you found someone that, that is a seamstress. What do you do? You drop off something once a week and just a couple items, and then you pick them up at the end of the day and they charge you an amount or whatever. So how does that arrangement work? And kind of what, what kind of flaws on jeans for people that want to sell jeans, what kind of yeah. flaws on jeans for you is a deal breaker? Yeah. So the types of, so what we do with her is, Again, it's mainly like the holes that are at the corner of back pockets. The uh, back pocket's like too heavy and it starts yeah. ripping. Um, those are easy fixes for her to do. Um, and then, or if there's like on the front pocket, it like got snagged and it's just like open and you can see the pocket lining. She'll just go in and stitch it a bit. Um, or like the belt loops. The belt loops will come off. off. Yeah. yeah. So she'll just pull them, put them back and everything. Those are the quick little fixes that people want fixed. They don't want those flaws. Sure. Um, so we'll, we'll spend the money. Obviously it has, the money has to still be there after we spend the money to have her repair it. Um, and then the stuff that I don't pick up at all are usually holes like in the crotch area or near the crotch. Like one, people don't want stitching and patches like right there, like the focal point. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't deal with that or anything that's like on the bottom, not necessarily the back pockets, but between the back pockets um, or anything that's just like outrageously shredded on but there is a caveat to oh. that. But if it's just shredded, it just does not look good. It looks like a piece of trash. I just don't deal with it. Or if it's super stained up and nasty, don't deal with it. However, if you know <laughs> what you're doing and you yeah. know your market and your customer, um, if it's Carhartt, you can basically get away with anything. It could be absolutely disgusting and somebody will buy it. <laughs> and it will be worth more. Yeah, than honestly. regular one. So, yeah. Okay, so that's good. Here's the million dollar question. This is what everyone came for. Mm -hmm. When there is a discrepancy between the tag, oh my gosh, yes. and the measurements, <laughs> what does Carrie do? This is the uh -huh. million dollar question right here. This is we should have saved this question for last. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> what does Carrie do? Okay, I have tried several different ways to to try. Oh, to communicate this to people when shopping online. And I would say my return rate is pretty 
decent for being in a jeans category where yes. almost every single pair shrinks or something. Oh, um, jeans are just, denim is like that. It's the best thing. It's also the worst thing because they morph to the wearer. Um, the person who wears it, maybe they needed to size up, but they squished into it and they stretched it out or they washed all their 100% denim in blazing hot water and then dried it in the Sahara and it shrinks like crazy. So <laughs> because I, jeans have to fit everywhere. They got to fit waist, thighs, calves, ankles, length. Yes. So they're they're tough. It's not like a shirt where you have two measurements. They they are very tough. Yeah, it is tough. So I have narrowed it down to have the most information but also give that information as quickly as possible because I don't want to spend forever trying to customize each listing and, you know, be super thorough on literally every single detail because I got stuff to list. So I have narrowed it down to um, the discrepancy of the tag. I will put the actual measurements in the title up, up top. I'll put the okay. actual measurements up there. I do a little asterisk next okay. to that size to indicate a note. Now, some people don't know that indicates a note, but I I would say majority of people know if there's a little asterisk next to something, it means a note. And then I will, in the pictures, provide photos of the measurements and of the tag. In the item condition notes, I will say this was tagged as a 3430, but it now measures 3228, whatever it is. And then I put the actual measurements in the listing details. And then at the very bottom in the condition description, or not the condition notes, but in the item description, I say, please refer to the condition notes because some sizing variants may happen or whatever mm -hmm. I have down there. So I have it like in five different spots to mm -hmm. show that these do not measure what the tag says and I still get returns. Sure. So <laughs> it happens. Yeah. However, all I want at the end of the day is to tell eBay when I get a false item not as described, that I say, hey, I tried five different times. Right. I offer free returns. Yep. And they will take that INAD off of my, or not my profile, but my seller, whatever yep. it's called, my record. Yep. Um, so that's the best way that I've found so far after trial and erroring with it. I know some people like to put, you know, the tag size and then at the end, the actual measurement, but I feel like that confuses Confu the algorithm. I, I think so too. I think it and confuses the buyer. when you have two different sizes, the buyer and the algorithm. I agree. Yeah. And you're also using up, I don't know, like five, six characters that you could put a killer keyword in to have somebody buy it. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather put a better keyword in it than two measurements. That are going to confuse somebody anyways. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so how important are keywords and nuance with jeans? So if they are trending right now, like baggy hip hop street, what or streetwear is definitely trending right now. So anything that I see as just a loose, straight, relaxed, straight, I will put baggy in there with it because some people are typing in baggy jeans, sure. even though it will describe in the jeans, like relaxed, straight, if I know it's still baggy, I'll put baggy in there. So it's a little redundant, but I'm capturing the people who are looking for the same pair of jeans that they've been wearing for years sure. and the people who are specifically on eBay just to find cool baggy jeans. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. All right. So jeans, great to sell, except when the summer comes. What do mm -hmm. we do in the summertime as a jean seller? We bulk up. <laughs> bulk up for the winter yeah. time that's the strategy yeah we bulk up for sure um i used to be so scared of it uh i it's just like summer slowdown in general like i was so nervous about it my first year you guys were all talking about summer slowdown i'm like oh no but i'm in the jeans category <laughs> i went through it i survived nice um honestly weirdly july was july for the past two years have been weirdly good that's crazy. like, I don't know why I don't yeah. have any explanation for, explanation for that. Um, but then, yeah, it just kind of like dies down until about August again. And that picks up um, and then we're back in full swing in the fall and winter. 
But I honestly, for this year's summer slowdown, I'm going to welcome it with open arms because I see it as an opportunity to bulk and get as many items on my store so that whenever more buyers come through during the fall and winter, I have a large selection for people to, to buy from. And then again, with the power of average over that course of the year, I'm going to make it. I'll survive. Yeah. Um, I also like to, obviously, I'm not going to not sell shorts because I kind of feel like it goes hand in hand with the jeans, but it's just pants in general. But I will pick up shorts that I know are just like the basics or this time this year, I'm going to actually start picking up a little bit more of the baggy shorts just because baggy is really trending for the jeans. I feel like it's just going to carry over into the summer. Obviously the brand and everything still have to be there, but I'll keep an eye out for those. And then the basic stuff that people are always wearing like cargo shorts or anything like sure. that, but that's what I'll do. Awesome. So, all right. So Jeans slow down a little bit. We're not worried about that. And we talk about that in the group. And that's kind of the same strategy that I use. I list all of my stuff year round. And for the summertime, I run my age inventory markdown strategy during that time. Kind of sell as much items as possible for the customers that are there and continue to list. And then Q3, I try to bulk up the store for Q4 because mm -hmm. my busiest months are always November, December, all the way through May. That's kind of like my time to shine. And then the other times, they're still great months, but not as good as those months. So, all right. So very good. So, but you guys aren't fools because Kyle, he posts his haul sometimes in the group. You guys are coming home with some good stuff that's other <laughs> than jeans. So like you guys are not fools. So yeah, if, if yeah, you guys obviously. are out there, you're getting it because I, I don't know how many Carhartt jackets you guys find. So you guys are not fools. You guys are out there. So yeah. All right. For for the jeans, like what has been the craziest pair that you've ever found and kind of like what is on the bucket list? So I I would say I mentioned it before, like a little earlier. I forgot to include on the the vintage dead stock brand new 501s from the 60s. Wow. They were salvage. Um, I listed them just under a thousand and they sold like that in like really? instant <laughs> and I was like what happened <laughs> I, I was like I was in shock because I was like did I I, I think yeah. I severely underpriced it but I never picked anything up that huge before like for jeans you know like jeans yeah. are just jeans like I understand with like shirts like they're cooler and there's a lot more cooler shirts out there especially when they're vintage but like with jeans it's like I don't know like you that's like one in a million to get a pair of yeah. selvage super old Levi's. Um, honestly, my bucket list items, I don't, if I could find another one, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I could relist it for more. <laughs> so for those ones that sold immediately, did they go to like Japan through a freight forwarder or what? Oh, you know what? At that time I checked and it, they didn't buy it through the global shipping program. It had a United States address. But at that time, I didn't know like gotcha. about that, the freight gotcha. forwarders. Now that I know about it, and I check now sometimes to see if they're going to a freight forwarder. But I don't know. Maybe it did. I don't know. Okay, I know Japan likely. is if, super if into it. Bet, yeah, if I had to bet those went to a freight forwarder. But usually the freight forwarders are going to be in Oregon. They're going to be in Florida, either Sarasota or Doral. And there's a couple of them in Dover, Delaware, and Springfield Gardens, New York. Um, And what, what those companies do is they consolidate a bunch of purchases for people and they ship it out in one box rather than the person overseas have to pay a bunch of different shipping. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So you, you found an item at the bins, you sold it for a thousand bucks in one second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're still alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're still alive. But in yeah. that instant, I, it, this is the, the, the worst feeling in the world. This happened to me just like it happens to everybody else. You list an item and you have your email open and you get the email that says your item has sold before you get the email that says, congratulations, <laughs> your item has been listed. Yeah. That means you have royally made a mistake. And that's happened a couple of times. Your item sold and then it says, thanks for listing your item. And you just go, ah. Uh -huh. So, all right, you sold an item for a thousand bucks. Were you bummed out it sold so quick or were you happy you got the thousand? It was... It was bittersweet for sure. 
because I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like I, cause whenever we found it, I was like, wow, that's insane. Like I was just happy to find that and then to list it. And then immediately it's just like all that happiness and joy. It was just like, oh my gosh, did I screw up? Like, <laughs> just like a train hit me. I'm like, oh my goodness. Yes. In the end, I'm glad. I'm just glad that I made that much money off of it. And it was good. It was good. I don't regret so, it, but so I've learned. <laughs> so a lot of people, like you said, you picked up a pair from the 1960s. And for Levi's, they're a 170 year old company. So mm -hmm. like people go, oh, I want to study Levi's. Good luck. They're 170 yeah. years old. They do a bunch of crazy stuff, just like Polo. Polo does a bunch of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, You'll look at a polo tag and you'll be like, oh, this is fake. But it's not. It's fine. It's totally real. They just do a bunch of crazy stuff. It's just stuff. weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Levi's does a bunch of crazy stuff. They're 171 years old. There are ways to learn tags. And in the group, we have a couple of resources, a couple of videos on learning tags. How did you go about tackling learning the tags on Levi's? Because that in itself is a monumental task. Honestly, I, I bugged Andy a lot. Because nice. he knew the Levi's and Wranglers way more than I did. Nice. And I, if you ask him, it's just me. At, I, I've i joked several times that I've given Andy like several heart attacks when I first started out. <laughs> just like giving him like stroke after stroke being like, hey, I listed this vintage pair for this much. And yeah. he's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's, he's like, oh my gosh, those have a special whiskering and they're like yeah. this kind of thing and they're this kind of wash and yes. they're this perfect size with this perfect inseam. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, I made 30 bucks. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he has been a huge help trying to yeah. figure out like all the nuances with Levi's. So I definitely recommend listening to him. Uh, he's so knowledgeable on it. Um, but learning the tags has helped, um, obviously in the beginning, because, uh, if it's 10 years older, you get a few more dollars out of it. And mm -hmm. versus, um, nowadays, if you find, you have to know if you find, okay. Nowadays, again, with the Levi's doing weird stuff, they're coming back out with big E tags big e. and a lot of people see yeah. a big E and they think I hit gold. Hit the lottery. Like, yeah. Oh, no, like you have to look at the tags. You gotta just, there's a lot more that go into it than just the big E. Um, and so it's not, it's worth, you know, like maybe like 30 bucks, but not the hundreds and thousands. So, sure. um, but yeah, you just, I would say that the best recommendation is to just either join the group and go to the jeans call and bug Andy like crazy. And about Andy's this. great. He'll get back to everyone. Andy is yes. Great. <laughs> Um, or just simple, like if you need it, like on the fly, like a Google search, there's so many different references out there now, just dating the Levi's tags. Honestly, one thing that I knew just recently learned was the modern, how to, how to date the modern ones, like the super modern ones. And it's not based off the year or month anymore. It's based off of the month and the weeks or something like that, or no, it's the weeks and the year. That's what it is. And so now whenever I look at it and somebody's asking like, what year is this made in and whatever, I'm like, I can't just look at it like the vintage ones. Like I have to actually like sure. find the new spot and actually reread it and everything. Sure. And but that's not it has as like common. a polyester tag versus a paper tag. Like all that stuff matters. Yeah. Like, like for Levi's, like Levi's, there's so much nuance in that. Cause like some of them can be worth a hundred thousand dollars. Some of them are worth no money and they're sold at Walmart. Same brand. Even like vintage we, pairs. Yeah. Even vintage pairs could be not worth anything just sure. because it's such a weird style. It's like, it's not your basic 505, 501s, whatever. It's just like a 536. And like, right. who knows that exists? Like, right. like <laughs> so nobody's looking cut. for it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> totally weird cut. So, all right. Where in the world did South Pole jeans come from being worth a bajillion dollars? Like those came out of, I nowhere. know that like, <laughs> what is going on here. So, I cannot yeah. tell you how many pairs of South Pole I have passed in my uh -huh. reselling career that are yeah. now worth $150, $200. What in the world is going on? That has been so fun because it's, it's under the radar still with like a lot, because at the bins, you got like the t-shirt, the t-shirt mm -hmm. gang and everything. And Obviously, if they see Jinkos, they're picking them up. Sure. Like, no, no question. 
but it's the South Poles that are under the radar. They, <laughs> yeah. And they are readily available. Yes. And they go for so much money. It's totally mind blowing. I was at a thrift and there was some young guys over there and um, they had some South Poles or whatever. And they were acting like they hit the jackpot. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh, he's South. I grew up when South Pole was coming out. Like they sold that at Sears and JC mm -hmm. Penney's. Like if, if you were wearing Sears and JC Penney clothes going to school, like they were going to ride you in. Like that wasn't cool. Yeah. That wasn't popping. <laughs> yeah. But like now, I don't know where in the world South Pole came from, but that came out of nowhere. And if you can have like the baggy ones, you know, mm -hmm. with, with some sort of like embellishment or design. Yeah. The more gaudy of a design, the better. Like it, if it's a basic pair, you can still get good money if it's baggy, just plain. But it's if it's got anything on that pocket or anywhere else, it's yeah. it's good money. Yeah. Um, one thing I found out though is not all South Poles. This is where the nuance is. Just because you see a South Pole pair of jeans doesn't mean it's gonna be big money. Um, a lot of times they'll have like moto skinnies. That's not in style right now. The skinny sure. Sure. motorcycle cut. So. Even though they may look super cool, just check the comps. That's all I can say. Just make sure you know what you're buying. But if you see a baggy pair of South Poles that have cool designs on the back pockets or anything or down the leg, it's just a no brainer. Just pick it up. Just sell it. And fashion is like that. It, it's it's circular and it also goes in waves. So like, I don't know, five years ago, skinny jeans was everything. No one wanted baggy jeans. And now that kind of wave is turning. Are there any skinny jeans that you pick up still? Or mm -hmm. they, I actually they... just got asked that question the other day. There, it's again certain style or certain brands in certain sizes. So yeah. it's your like Judy Blues or your Spanx or anything like that, where it's just a basic default that people. I'm, and this is for women's. Okay, I don't really pick up many men's skinny jeans anymore unless they're kind of like a skater e type look because those people still wear that but mainly for the women's I'll pick up um they have to be like around the mid size like anywhere between an 8 up to a 14 um like the little tiny petite ones I don't pick up anymore and I don't really pick up a lot of plus size anymore but around that range and a standard cut you know, black, blue, distressed a little bit or no distressing at all. I know that we went through a time where it was just like the full leg was just shredded. I don't pick those up anymore. So I'm very particular with the skinny jeans. Um, and it's usually just those two brands that I only pick them up in. Okay. So are you very conscious on size or, or and is that brand by brand by brand? Because I know a very picky buyer. My friend Corby from Full Court, I did a video with him. He is the most pickiest buyer that I've ever dealt with, but in a great way. He knows exactly what he wants. He has his quirks, and that's what makes him a beautiful business operator. He knows this pair of jeans, I want them between a 32 and a 36, will not take a 38. This mm -hmm. pair of jeans, I can go up to a 38, but I will not take a 40. And on him, it's like brand dependent. And then inside of that brand is the size. So like for um for Levi's, like he doesn't want more than a 36, but like Jabodes with the shuttle tape, he'll mm -hmm. take up to 38s. And I'm like, but dude, these are 40s. They're great colors. No, thank you. I'm like, dude, these are size 40 Jabodes. They're a great color. They will sell. No, thank yeah. you. So like for him, he has to deal with a brick and mortar store. So he's much more, has much more constraint on the customer mm -hmm. where like these size 40 Jabodes will sell in one second on eBay. So like yeah. he has that constraint, but like even on eBay, there is a constraint. So are you very conscious on waste and inseam and does it vary between brands? Yeah. I mean, it's commendable that he is very particular because obviously he knows what sells. And I want to get to that point where I know exactly what sizes sell super well for each individual brand and style. Nice. Um, I'm not there yet, but, you know, I'll get there at some point, probably. Uh, the knowledge that I have right now is generally for men's jeans, if it's over 40, I'm not, I'm not really going to pick it up because okay. at that point it's like the market, I feel like shrinks too much. 
Um, the only things that I'll pick up that are like over 40 specifically would be like, um, like workwear overalls, um, because I know farmers like to yeah. wear bigger, baggier Those stuff. Big, yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. So, but again, I don't, I don't pick up many overalls just cause they're really bulky. Um, but yeah, I try to stick between, um, a 30 to 40. Okay. And those are generally the sizes that I have no problem selling. Now, once we get below 30, those will still sell, but I'll pick them up. I'll pick them up only in like American Eagles because I'm thinking the sure. again, you have to know the buyer right. and people who are size 28. I don't Younger. really even pick up 26s anymore, yeah. but 28 are going to be like the middle school to high school boys who want to sure. wear American Eagle jeans. Sure. So, and that's about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I generally stick between the 30 and 40 fair game across the board for all the different brands. Um, and then for the women's, it, again, it kind of depends, but I, I like to stay no smaller than a two, just because again, the market for people who wear less than a two are very small. And then I go all the way up. I mean, I go all the way up to like 20 plus, like the 20 waist. I'd start slowing down at the 22 unless it's a certain brand like Judy blue. I know there's, a, they have more of a wider market for people who want Judy blue that are in the plus sizes. But again, I try to stick between a size two to about a size 14 to 18 for most brands for the women's. So like that knowledge is super impressive. And we talk about that a lot in the group of knowing your customer. And I think that that is very, very, very important when we're listing an item, because if we don't know the customer, we cannot use the right keywords and then we can't make a really good informed buying decision when we are picking them up. So like you said, if it is American Eagle or something like that, makes perfect sense why you will look for or accept a smaller size on those. Um, a couple of things that I remember from the jeans call and in my personal experience is that any pants that has a wider waist than the inseam, those are usually very difficult to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a 38, 28, hard. Yeah. But jeans that have a smaller waist with a longer inseam than the waist, I've always done well with those. So like a 32, 36, I've done well. Mm -hmm. Or um, like a 30, 34, I've done well. But if it's wider waist, shorter inseam, you might have those for the rest of your, your eBay career, in my experience. Yeah. And that's something I've ran into a lot with the size discrepancy. So it may be a 30-inch inseam on the tag. Oh. but they washed it and it shrunk three inches. And so I'm like, well, I'm stuck with a 27 inch inseam now. Um, obviously I have to list it a little bit less than a true 30 inch, but those are far few in between. Thankfully, it's not that dramatic, but you, cause you can kind of tell when you hold it up, if it's a little wonky looking or janky looking, <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a little weird looking, then maybe not pick it up. And cause there's just going to be more down the road Absolutely. to pick up. So you're not stuck with it. All right. So let's switch gears a little bit because the knowledge is impressive. We can go on all day about that. So as someone with two kids, wife, you got to deal with Kyle all day. <laughs> how does the schedule look? The normal schedule. How does your normal schedule look running an eBay business that did just about a quarter million dollars? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's unfairly easy uh, just because I think Kyle and I are just naturally wired to optimize as best as we can. Just, you know, we don't want to spend forever doing something, even though it, if we spend forever doing something, it's because we suck at it and then we try to get better and better and just try to improve. So to where we can do our whole work in just a few hours and then we're done for the day, we're not stuck doing this all day. Um, and then it allows more opportunities for me to do things like homeschool my, my kids, um, have a social life with our friends or just go out with the family. Wait, you're an eBay seller that has a social life? Yeah. <laughs> Those exist? Yeah. Every every Friday we hang out with our friends and then we nice. sprinkle in throughout the month with other friends and family and stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's, I can't really say what a schedule looks like because I feel like having two kids, it's kind of hard to have right. like a diehard yeah. strict 
schedule. Um, everything's a little bit different every day, but the rhythm is the same. The same stuff gets done every day. And if it gets done like a few hours later than the day before, it still got done type of thing. So you go out with friends, you go out with family. What do they think about you and Kyle selling a bunch of old jeans on the computer? I know. I <laughs> thought about this. <laughs> um, so some of our friends have stated it with our with our family too. They just kind of look at you like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's like no respect. <laughs> um, they're just not nodding their head out of being oh. polite. Like, yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> um, but we got um, a few friends and family members that are just like, that's insane. Like they're yeah. like our cheerleaders and they're just like, that's awesome. Like they had, it blew their mind and they're like, go for it. They're honestly are one of our best friends will uh, almost on a weekly basis, just be like, can I go sourcing with you? Because he oh, loves cool. the bins. Cool. And he has no idea about jeans that much, but he just knows, just dig around and find jeans, pull out what looks cool, <laughs> and then just hand them over and we'll go through them. But it's, I don't, I don't really talk about eBay with most of our people. <laughs> it's so weird because it's either the old, oh, they like pat you on the head uh, or yeah. it's, or it's, oh, I have a bunch of figurines I want you to sell for me. Yeah. And they're like, no, thank you. Uh, we honestly, we have one friend who who despises resellers. And I think he's a little disappointed that we are resellers. Oh. But <laughs> he despises them more so in like the video game world uh, sure, and the absolutely. toys. Yeah. He's like, if he was more concerned about like the clothing, then there might actually be issues. But we've tried explaining to him time after time after time how we're not what he thinks we are <laughs> so we just don't talk about it we just yeah, move there, on <laughs> there's a difference i think in what we do and then in the ones who like ran around and bought all the chlorine tablets yeah. and there was a chlorine shortage like that's different um yeah. but also at the end of the day like every single store even walmart they're a reseller they buy stuff mm -hmm. for cheaper that's what we mark it up like <laughs> yes. every single that, that's how the world goes around and if you took away every single reseller of a product the entire world's economy would crumble in an instant. Yeah. So yeah. there's just different levels to it. So, all right. So you love a good challenge. From time to time, we've spoken on the calls and you like a challenge. You you like to be pushed a little bit. You, you, like, you like a good challenge. The other day you wrote me and you said, hey, I want to do your day when you were doing 120 items a day. Mm -hmm. And you asked me what that looked like. And for those that don't know, for several years, I listed 120 items every single day by myself, took the photos, went out and sourced 120, because if you're going to list 120, you're going to source 120. And then I packaged up and shipped 120 items. I did that every single day of my life for many years before I got employees. And when people hear that, they think it's crazy. They think it's impossible to do. And I always tell them, it takes about 16 hours to do it. So I am so glad that you did it. I want to hear all about it. And I am so glad it took you 16 hours because yep. that's literally how long it takes. To yeah. So like all this time, everyone thinks like, oh, it's impossible. It's impossible. Well, we have a person who has done it. Yay. They did it for a day. And I'm and still here. Exactly 16 hours, just like I've been saying this entire time. Uh -huh. So where did the idea come from? And tell me. Tell me everything, because we haven't even spoke about it. You said you gave me the time, and the time was 16 hours, and I go, that's about right. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, so I, again, uh, at the beginning, you mentioned I'm on YouTube. So I picked up YouTube again uh, just last month, and just to share, just to document the journey, because I love looking back at old pictures and videos of where we were, um, <clears throat> but I, had a video that took off really well. It was the daily routine of a $240,000 eBay seller. And I think that title, people were like intrigued, like, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, so in the YouTube call in this group, uh, I was talking with Mel and she's like, you know, you had good success with that video. Like, think about what you can do revolving around that. And I was like, 
what if I did a video of doing the daily routine of a $1.2 million eBay seller? And I was thinking that would be even bigger and grander. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I... I knew that you did 120. I like I knew going into it what you did <laughs> every day. Um what was like what got me nervous was I was coming from being a 30 a day seller, jumping into a 120 a day seller overnight yeah. and everything that goes with it. And uh, a little bit of a backstory about what our daily routine looks like. I have uh, graduated from sourcing and photoing and I do the processing and the listings of eBay and Kyle does the sourcing because he loves sourcing. Um, so he does that. So we kind of split the work doing 30 a day. It's really light work. It's hardly anything. So doing this by myself, four times in what we do, I'm like, I was just, I was nervous going into this challenge, but I was, I, like you say, I love a good challenge. I like to be able to do hard things because it helps build confidence and you like, you learn stuff from it. And I was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to have fun doing this, uh, even though I'm going to hate myself like the next day or something. <laughs> all right. So let's go all the way from the beginning. You sent me a random message on Instagram and you said, what did your day look like when you were doing a hundred a day? And I think the first thing I was I replied was I woke up at four o'clock in the morning. So what what was Dead. that? Let's go line by line. Yes. I started at four o'clock in the morning. What was the thought? I hate it. <laughs> hate it already. We haven't yeah. even got into it. And then you said, okay, how many how many did you source? And I said, I sourced 120 a day. And I went around to a bunch of different thrift stores, or I would go to the flea market three times a week. So what was your plan for doing that? How were you going to find 120 in one day? I was just wishing that I would find 120 <laughs> a day. Because <laughs> again, I sourcing is not my thing. Like I'll, I'll tap, I'll tag along with Kyle and like pick and poke and be like, oh, here's this, here's that. But to like go in just me to all these different places, find 120 items. I'm like, I may be able to do this before the stores close. I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> okay. So 120, it still has to be good items that meet the metric. We just yes. can't bring home 120. So, all right. Yes. You walked out the door. You got to find 120. What exactly did you do that day sourcing wise? Okay. So I had to, the day before I was planning my route, and this is the one takeaway, or not the one, but it was a takeaway that I had from this is you have to think different to do this. You can't just do what you do every day and yeah. expect that result. Right. So I had to think like, okay, how, what's my route? Like I needed to know what stores I needed to hit first that had usually a better ROI with oh, yeah. sourcing yep. and, um, I also had to schedule around the bins because uh, and you didn't go to the bins whenever you were doing it, no. but my flea markets are absolute trash over here. <laughs> so that's basically my flea market is the okay. bins. Um, but my bins, they open up two times. So they open from nine to, or from 10 to one, and then they close, cycle everything out and then open back up from three to five. Okay. And so I had to not miss those opportunities, like those windows. So I strategically planned my route to hit the bins when they first opened each time. And then I also had to figure out how much time was between each store and how much time I needed to spend in each store to keep <laughs> on track. <laughs> and then I also had to average out how many I needed to find per store. Right, and so I right, could kind right. of keep an idea if I'm on track or not. Right. So a lot of prep work had to go into that. But I obviously did it. So <laughs> yeah, I, I remember going to stores and I'm like, okay, I got 27. I'm, I'm five behind. So I got to come over with five. The next store you pull four and you're like, oh, I'm screwed today. Mm -hmm. And then the next one you might find 46 and you're like, I'm back on target. We're good. Yep. And um, all right. So yeah. And like you said, the movements and the mind state and the operation the operations of someone that does 10 a day are different from someone that does 20 a day. Mm -hmm. The movements, the mind state, the operations, the decisions are different from someone that does 20 to someone that does 30 a day. 
and the same thing, so on and so forth. So like, if you do 30 a day, it is a completely different mind state, a completely different movement to do 50 a day. It's just completely different. Everything about it is different. Mm -hmm. So, all right, you run around. About how long did that take to wrangle up 120 items? Um, I wrote down my notes. Hold on. It <laughs> took me eight hours, roughly eight hours, finding 15 items per hour to do this. Yeah. And I was talking to Isaiah the other day and he was like, man, 120 a day is only 15 an hour. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It's 15 an hour all day. That's what it is. And like yeah. 15 an hour isn't lightning speed. It's no, just it's too, a long time of doing it. It's honestly, the drive time is a lot. It's about yeah. half of it, honestly. Yes. Um, but I don't know. It's a good break <laughs> between just driving. But uh, it's just two stores an hour. It, it Obviously, it depends yeah. like where you're located and like how, how many stores you got around you. But I, it took me about two stores an hour. And yeah. I average, you know, finding between seven to 10 or five to 10, a store, mm -hmm. just depending on the store. Yeah, it was the same for me, about two stores an hour, depending on the route. All right. So we get everything. We bring it home. We got 120 items. We're carrying a massive amount of bags from the car. I remember yeah. those days. Well, what they don't next? have bags. We had. We had oh, yeah. We've clubs. done away with bags. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've done away with bags. Yeah, you got to carry it out, which. I'm okay with, I just stack it in the car and I just bring the stack in. Salvation right. Army was the only one that gave me bags and I was so thankful for it. <laughs> All right. So we bring home our haul, 120 items. Now we got a photograph, prep, list. How does the yeah. rest of the day go? So what I did, I did it reversed because, um, again, I didn't know what I could do and everything. So I wanted to do all my sourcing after everything else. So I woke up at 4 a.m. and started doing the packages, the photos, and the listings before I went sourcing. Oh. Yeah. I Actually, I woke up at 3 a.m. Okay. because I had to get ready, drink coffee, not be a zombie because my <laughs> usual wake-up time is my usual. I'm usually out of bed at 8, 8 a.m. <laughs> so. Okay. So you woke up at 3 a.m. Yep. and you did the photos and the listing before you left? Yeah. So I started work at 4 a.m. It took me at that time. I tried. I did this on a Monday so I could have as many packages to do as possible. Yeah. And honestly, the weekend was a little slower. So I, I only had 80 packages at the time, but I came back around at the end of the day to do what sold <laughs> so I could try to get to the 120. Nice. So it took me about an hour and a half to do the 80 packages and like pull them and package, label them, everything. I started photos at 5.30 in the morning. And this is where I haven't taken pictures in over a year. That's brutal then. That is yep. brutal. <laughs> and I, I remember telling you, I was like, I have my tendonitis in my hands and everything. <laughs> so I was like being all like wimpy and whatever. Surprisingly, it was great. I did not have any problems, but I started photos at 5.30. Took me two and a half hours to do 120 of those right, yeah. which surprised me I, yeah. I was shocked at that the listings I knew I would breeze through it just because I'm super fast at it anyway and that's what I do every day um but because packages and the list or the photos took me longer than I thought I started later than I wanted to for the listings because I was trying to get it all done before I went sourcing okay. so at 8 a.m I started listings and I was able to do 70 in an hour and a half and I had to leave. It was a hard time at 930 to get to the bins to start sourcing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so then I sourced until I got my 120. The sun was going down. It was almost set completely. By the time I found my last item, I came back home <laughs> and I did not cry at all. It's <laughs> like, I got 50 more listings to do. <laughs> <laughs> And I packaged 14 more items that sold. So I, I did 94 packages, 120 listings, 120 source items, and I was done. <laughs> so for me, in the tree service, when I was kind of over my head, I would look at the guys and I would go, this is so stupid. 
Mm -hmm. there any time during this marathon 14 hours, 16 hours where you just said, this is so stupid? Um, that's whenever I was photographing. <laughs> <laughs> in the very beginning I was like what did I get myself into <laughs> but you said you were surprised it only took two and a half hours yeah I well it's, it was in the beginning um I felt like such a noob putting things up and getting the measuring stick out <laughs> and trying to like do things I'm like oh my gosh this is horrible but I got faster as I kept going on and doing it um but that was the only time where I was like it's 5 30 in the morning the sun is not up here. I am photographing and I hate photographing. And I was just like regretting my decisions then. Oh. Um, but as soon as I got sourcing, I was nervous, but as I got like some quick wins, I was feeling real good about it. Nice. And then I finished it. The only time I started regretting it a little bit later was whenever I was coming home and I had to do my listings, 50 more. Like my, my other <laughs> listings. And during this time, you also, you were walking so much. And I was, I was like, I'll, I'll do the 10 miles. No problem. Because I'm going to be sourcing and walking around a lot. And I'll just walk on my treadmill while I'm making my listings. But it was so physically tasking that I could not do the 10 miles because my body, like, I felt like I was going to fall apart. I was oh like, I can't goodness. do this. So well, I managed remember, to do six. Before you started, I, I had a disclaimer, not responsible for any <laughs> sort. I, that came up a couple times. Um, whenever, again, my body was hurting, I was like, not responsible. Not responsible. And then while sourcing, um, whenever I'm under like stress or anything, like sometimes it's super weird, but like sometimes I'll get like a migraine and it affects my vision. Not and responsible. I'm like not responsible. And then the next day from the stress, I woke up with a cold sore. I was like, not responsible. Not responsible. <laughs> I said, I said, not responsible for any health <laughs> impacts or anything like that. But so, the, um... the crazy thing is, is um, I've been like, oh, I froze a little bit. The okay. crazy thing is, is I. For like the past six months, I've been like on a, like trying to lose some weight. Um, I woke up the next day, three pounds under. Explain that to me. It's the 120 a day diet right there. How about yeah. that? I'm like, so do this every day. You'll wake up richer and skinnier. <laughs> so when you said, how many miles were you doing on the treadmill? I, I pulled up like one of my ridiculous days. Like one day I did 33 miles on the treadmill. <laughs> What did you think when I sent you that picture at first? You sent that to me and I just sat there. I was like, oh, what am I looking at? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm freezing. Oh, no. Okay. Um, but I was just like, I don't know how he physically has done that. Like, that, how did he walk like eight hours straight? <laughs> yeah, that was a bad day. That, I had a bunch of work to do on the computer. So like for me. Work and the treadmill go hand in hand. So like if I'm not done with my work computer, I don't get off the treadmill. I just mm -hmm. can't do it. And I that was just a horrible day for me. So I ended up doing like 33 miles straight that day. But normally yeah. I do like 15 or so. But I, I wish I could have saw you read that message where you said, how many miles do you do a day? And I pulled up the Fitbit screenshot showing 33. I bet you were like... <gasps> get out of town <laughs> yeah I, I was like I, I was thinking like around 10 and then you got that and I was like oh I don't know if I can do that <laughs> so you did it congratulations what were I guess the takeaways did you learn anything how was it tell the people how it was yeah well <clears throat> I I I've learned a few things so I wrote them down um, I know I touched base on it a little bit. I surprised myself in certain categories that I didn't know that I would succeed in. Um, obviously, if I have been doing this, uh, you know, day in, day out, I would be faster at this. Like mm -hmm. with the photos, like every single thing I was doing, I was getting faster towards the end of it. And so I know, you know, if you go in day in, day out, you'll get better and faster every day. Um, it's simple. The process is simple. It just, like I said, takes a different mindset, like a tenacity to just get it done. And no, like, no matter what the cost is, like, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And you just got to do it. My, my constant thought throughout the day was 
Um, I need to move faster. I need to be faster. I don't need distractions. I just need to be like eagle eye this stuff, get in, get out, like no dilly dally at all, because that would, that would kill the progress with that. But yeah, the, the mindset preparation, um, and it was like a shock to my mind, uh, again, coming in from 30 a day, jumping to immediately 120. It was a shock to the way I did stuff, the way I operated every day, the way I thought about things, the way I spent my time. And now coming in after it, you think about it differently. It's like, it, it was like a jolt of, I don't know, like electricity, just be like shock you out of your everyday mundaneness and just be like, whoa, I actually did that. And then you look at everything else in your life differently. So it was just, it was a really great challenge. And in the video, I say, uh, if you are in my shoes where you're doing the same thing day in, day out, and you're good, you know, your numbers and you got the money to do this. Cause obviously you got to spend more money than usual to buy this stuff. Um, then just try it out. I said, do not do it if you don't know your numbers or if you're just starting out or anything, but definitely try this out at some point because it is super beneficial. Like I can do this. So it was just really good. Did you put a disclaimer, not responsible for any health repercussions if I you should. do try this out? Yes. Maybe go back and edit that <laughs> yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. So so for for um all right, all that is great. So I think a lot of people like they hear me say I do this and they think it's cat, they think it's a lie. Yes, a hundred percent. I'll tell people who don't even know you, like yeah. they'll just be at the bends. I'll be like, Oh yeah, he was selling this much a day and doing this much. And they're like, No, he wasn't. It's yeah. like you don't even know him. <laughs> like, how can you say that? But you did it. And that was two days ago, not even 48 hours ago. You did it. And you're sitting here. You're alive. You're fine. Yeah. Honestly, like I, I can see us doing 120, like with Kyle and I, uh, I know we could double it and do 250, but like, again, with homeschooling the kids mm -hmm. and everything, like I, I had to drop the kids off at grandma's for this challenge because I did <laughs> not want to drag them through that. And I could not even handle that. Like the kids can drive me crazy after like the second thrift store of them be like, can we buy this? Can we buy that? And I'm like, yeah. I needed to focus. So I know sustain sustainably, I wouldn't be able to do 120 by myself right now, but I could do a good amount by myself sure. and I can do like, I can do 60 by myself, like sure. no problem, but work around it, you know, but yeah. So that's the best that's thing not. about the whole thing is like everyone asks me like, oh, break down the day. I break down the day and the times were exactly the same times as yours. But, which is insane because I thought I was doing so slow because I thought you would have been like way faster at this and like it takes as no long problem. as it, it takes as long as it takes. Like that's, yeah. <laughs> it just takes as long as it takes. So like people were like, how long did it take for you to photo and list? And I'm like between four or five hours and you were at the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Like you could get about a minute of listing, a minute of photo. And like it takes as long as it's going to take. And the rest of the day you spend shipping, you spend going out and finding new stuff and you do the same thing over and over again. So like it's nothing superhero, but um, how you described it, that it does take a tenacity and it does take willpower and it does take you know, wanting that same result every single day, that is absolutely what it does take. And I think anybody that has listened to the podcast, like those are probably some of the strongest words that kind of encompass everything that I am. Like I, I do have a lot of tenacity. I do have a lot of willpower. So like it yeah. was just something that I did and it was fine. And I, I am very fortunate because of it. And like, it's not impossible to do. So with that said, you did it once. When are you doing it again? Because it's one thing to do it once. Mm -hmm. Next video, <laughs> I did 120 for a month. And we might have yeah. different results here. So I I wouldn't be opposed to doing it again, like for a longer period of time. I just have to be financially responsible yeah. for it. So yeah. I have to make sure I've got enough like surplus in the month to go out and buy a massive amount than usual. But I told Kyle, I said, when when is it your turn? Oh, <laughs> so. you threw the gauntlet down? You told Kyle yep. to do it? Oh, yeah. boy. 
So you guys should you guys should have a race and see who does it who does it quicker. <laughs> yeah, I I think I've got him with the uh with the listings portion because he's not he's not super computer savvy. Yeah. If, so. if you're doing seventy in one hour, like that's top tier. Like that that's probably where I am too. Like because there were times where um like when I'm really really rolling on listings, I'm about that i don't i don't know if i'm going any faster than that but like if i'm really rolling that's about as fast as as, as one could get i think yeah and i made sure that like the i prepped like obviously like you would have a rolling 120 to yeah, do the, the queue, yeah. so i made sure beforehand i had a 120 ready to nice. go i'm nice. frozen oh, okay there good. we go <laughs> but good. i made sure that everything in there it wasn't like the random Carhartt jacket that I found or whatever. It's just like, it was just the jeans and the pants and shorts that I do. And like nothing super crazy that I had That's to do. Okay. Like we'll we'll give on. you that. We'll give yeah. you that. <laughs> For me, I was doing everything, but it I doesn't know. matter. You did it. You are the nervous. champ. <laughs> you are the champ. You did it. And I knew you were going to do it. I didn't doubt you for one second. So I'm very glad that you did it. I'm glad that you had fun. I'm glad you're still alive. And for the folks that do want to watch that video, that video is out now. Mm -hmm. And what is the title? And tell them where they can find you. And I enjoyed this conversation. This was a fun conversation. Like you said, you've been at this yeah. for two going on three years. You guys have had a lot of success. I know for your husband, Kyle, he used to work. And now he's working with you. So you brought him home. And you guys are doing fantastic. And um, I, I, I really enjoy when you ask your questions in the group because they are very challenging. Um, they are very thought out. And, um, you know, I, I do appreciate your success and makes me feel good when, when people like you are succeeding. So yeah, I just definitely. want to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I want to make sure that, you know, you have, I, I want to be more vocal about the group because there's a lot of successful people coming out of that group and I want to just be able to document it and voice it as well. Because it really is like if you did not do this, like give us this opportunity, you've seriously changed so many people's lives because of this, whether it's just a small amount or a large amount like ours. But I'm definitely like 100% grateful that I found this group and that you were so generous to share your information and all your knowledge with us. But the video, I'm going to title it probably the same thing, uh, daily routine, doing the daily routine of a $1.2 million eBay seller. And I'm nice. going to have a thumbnail of me maybe like in bed, like hitting the alarm clock at like 3 a.m. or something. <laughs> <laughs> and just something absurd. Like this is insane. Um, and my YouTube channel is Carrie at home. Nice. And yeah, that's how you can find me. Thank you so much for jumping on, joining us. I, I do think that this is super duper helpful. And much like Nina, you guys kind of have a similar story. You guys are moms with kids and both of you guys are crushing it. And I think that that is a very, very important story to tell. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm very glad that um, people like you and Nina come on and, and you talk about it. And, you know, it's work, but the payoff is there. And like you said, you're homeschooling. You brought your husband home with this business. So you guys are living the dream. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate you and I appreciate you for coming on and thank you everybody. And as always, be great. <laughs>